Good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all out here tonight as we uh, gather together, together again and um, hear what God has to speak to us through Don. Um, for a short scripture, I'm going to be reading Matthew 11, um, 28 through 30. Um, it kind of goes with the first song we're going to be singing and and goes along, I think, with what Don has um, been talking about a little bit, just coming to God. And so Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am a gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, so if you would join us in standing as we um, worship. <coughs> Run to the Father.
Father, we thank you that um, we can give our burdens to you, that we can come to you and that you're waiting um, with arms open wide and waiting with arms full of grace. Thank you that you can be our best friend. Thank you for being our, our good father. by you, and God, as we are loved by you, you call us deeper, deeper in love to, to you, to those around us.
let that be evident in our lives, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Um, Don, come ahead, come forward, and Matt's going to have a prayer for you. The rest of you may be seated. Thanks, Matt. Mm-hmm. I'd say it pays. <clears throat> well, good evening. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there are ushers or if it's Pastor Bob and Pastor Sherman, but I'd like to know when I come to a church like this. Who decides how many sacred pews? How, how do we know there's that nobody's allowed to sit up here? Who who decides that? They use them for weddings. They you say that you do use them for weddings. For weddings. That's. You know, I have, I have, that's the first time I ever heard that piece, <laughs> but not funerals. Okay. Hi, James, Darla. Fancy meeting you in the Big Valley. Good to see you. <clears throat> well... It feels to me like this these days have just evaporated. Um, but Jay and Rosemary, you might as well know that the way you've treated us so royally, we will come back. <laughs> and that's true for all of you. It's just been a delight to get acquainted with you and the ways that you've shared your hearts with us along the way. We have been talking about <clears throat> a lot about the heart and about feelings, which feelings and emotions, which I say sometimes it, that's not the heart, it's just the language of the heart. We've talked a lot about pain. And um, back about six years ago, I think it is now, in 2014, uh, there was a, a fascinating, unique study that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. And you know that I enjoy reading medical studies and those kinds of things. And there were, there were two Dutch scientists um, that did an experiment, a study, um, and they, were, they exposed a, um, a, a number of test subjects to a wide range of different kinds of scenarios to stir in them some of the most basic or primal human emotions. And we could think of joy and anger and, and fear, anxiety, and a variety of emotions. So what they did was they hooked them up to uh, EEG, electroencephalogram leads, 
um, in order to measure the, the quantitative amount of the brain's response to these different emotions. And the results were pretty conclusive and pretty amazing. Because as measured just by the sheer volume of brain activity and neurological reaction, the most powerful emotion was what? What do you think? Man, it's quiet here. Human touch? Just being touched. What? That's an activity. What, what would be the emotion that would go with that? Love? Loneliness. Loneliness. Well, you heard me say, I think that's probably the most profound human pain. Yeah, but it wasn't loneliness. Joy. Joy. That's a powerful one. One that I, if I had another day or two, I would probably talk to you about joy. Love. That's powerful too, but it wasn't that one. Fear. Sorry. It was humiliation. And so I want you to stop and think about that just a little bit because it explains so much. First morning that I was here, I said that God is a relational God. We live in a relational universe. And he created you and me for relationships. We're social creatures, if you will. And part of that is, part of that design and who we become, we look for people around us, from people around us, we look for acceptance. And that's why, typically, a lot of the time, fitting in Conforming is so much easier than standing out, standing apart from the crowd, even, even when what the crowd is doing makes absolutely no sense. And then what happens? Even in church sometimes, we come to church and we, we don't quite fit in with what everybody else thinks or is doing and we get labeled a what? Troublemaker? Yeah? Rebel? Radical? One of my favorite authors goes to that mythic story uh, of the Lion King. I don't know what you think about those kinds of movies. Um, but in that, in that mythic story, there's a lion cub by the name of Simba, who as a young, just as a cub, he gets separated from his dad through a murder which was engineered by his uncle, uh, Scar, who was the character that symbolized evil in this story. And the uncle arranges for the cub to get caught in a stampede of wildebeests because he knew that his father, who, Mufasa, would risk his life to rescue uh, the cub, his son. And he does, and Simba is saved, but Mufasa is killed in this stampede. So then Scar turns on this lion cub, on 
Simba and, and accuses him of what? Who knows the story? Yeah, being the cause of his father's death. And at a horribly vulnerable, desperate kind of time, and so Simba, brokenhearted and frightened and just sort of destroyed by grief and guilt, Simba does what? Runs away from home. And so I would suggest to you that, that in that little story from, I guess, Hollywood, I don't know where it comes from, but one of the most profound lessons that you and I can learn is that that's the enemy's purpose with you and me, to separate us from the Father. And so we're going to pause for just a quick moment before we jump into the, into the um, focus this evening. But I think it was on Sunday morning when I... Or was it evening when I told you the story of the Holderman hymn sing? There is liberty. So this is your turn now for a quick reflection on where we've been so far this week. Questions or something that the Holy Spirit just dots, that the Holy Spirit connected in your heart. Anyone? And remember, I, I checked this all out with Pastor Sherman. It's okay if you talk to me. I'm sorry? Forgiveness is not easy. In fact, forgiveness is very costly because it's paying someone else's debt, right? Yeah. But it's so simple. All it means is just going to the cross and canceling the debt. But because it's a debt, it's costly. Yeah, you're exactly right, Kevin. But it's the only path to freedom and to healing. Oh, my. Quick review from last evening. A lot of us, well, not you, but a lot of places I go, People don't connect forgiveness, un, don't connect unforgiveness with suffering. Yeah. And that's because we have a loving Father. Who else? Anyone? Was that sort of the distinction between the legal work that you and I do that it's just canceling a debt? That doesn't automatically take it into heart healing. That's what Jesus comes to do. Yep. Good point. I like when people get that part. Anyone else? And sometimes it costs way more to hang on to it than it does to let it go. The price that we pay in the bitterness and resentment. Yeah. Anyone else? So this is the enemy's I think, his central purpose, to separate you and me from the Father. And he doesn't really care how he does that. He can start, I think he most often starts with you and me when we're really young, because that's where we start, really young. Uh, and he may use neglect to whisper in our hearts something like, um, you see, no one cares. In fact, you're not even worth caring about. Or he might use some kind of sudden loss of innocence 
to come and whisper, this is a dangerous world and you're all alone. You've been abandoned and thrown aside. Or he uses assaults or abuses in some way to, to scream at a, a boy or a girl, this is all you're good for. You're just nothing more than a throwaway. And the way that he comes to you and me is he makes it impossible for us to know. I love the song. I, where's the, the worship leader? You're a good, good father. He's a good father. And that's what the enemy wants to change way deep in our hearts and cause us to believe the lies that he's something else. The details or the particulars of, of your story is unique to you. It's true for each one of us. But the, but the result is always the same. It's like a gash in the heart. And with it, with that wound or with that gash, comes separation and suspicion of the Father. For me, it started when I was, I think, probably three years old through what I've concluded now was an innocent exposure by a, a VSer in our home when I was, I think, three, four years old. I have a, a dear friend in Ohio. For him, it started at when he was a year and a half old with a babysitter. And, and it's, it's always effective. But the beautiful part of that is that God is not willing to let that simply be the end of the story. Not for any of us. You remember, in, uh, here's a whole other sermon, but we're, we'll skip it for tonight. Luke chapter 15. You remember uh, what Jesus taught us in that story that we often call in Luke 15... The story of the son who left, and we call it what? The prodigal son. Help me out. What does prodigal mean? Some of you English people here. Not a trick question. It, it can mean what? Wasteful. But you know what one of the first definitions is? Extravagant. Lavish. And before that son ever left home, the father forgave him. He was lavish with mercy and grace. The son essentially wished his dad was dead when he asked for that inheritance. I understand according to Jewish culture, dad could have had his son, stunt, his son stoned, but he didn't. And so for me, I, I've come to think of that story really, it wasn't a story so much about the son, but it was a story about the prodigal father, the father who was lavish and extravagant with his love. And that was the, the father that Jesus pictured. He was, his heart was full of compassion and he ran to meet that son who was coming back. And that's the father that you and I have. But it's the father that the enemy doesn't want you and me to know in that, in that kind of way. It might seem this evening like I'm talking to the men, and I am, but the concepts, the principles are are true for all of us. And so hopefully we'll broaden it out. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, Moses, I think, was talking there, and he said, there's no other nation that has a God like ours, a God who is near to us when we pray. I love that picture. God is there. Paul talks, he gives us different pictures in the New Testament. He says, he talks about how we're, we're raised up and we're seated in the heavenlies. How many of you felt like you were seated in the heavenlies today? Don't raise your hands, you don't need to. 
I'm guessing that some of you were in the thick of things just trying to get stuff figured out. Didn't feel very much like the heavenlies. But you know something? That is our legal position in Christ. Paul says that we are more than what? Conquerors through him who loved us. Another place he said that, that we are, how does he say it? We are hidden, tucked away with Christ in God. Sunday morning we started with the verse from Isaiah. Let's run to the house of the God of Jacob. He will show us the way he works so that we can live the way he created us or the way he designed us um, and the way he works. I was sitting um, a few years back now, I was sitting with a friend of mine, um, spent a couple days with, with um, him and his wife and our close friends, but he was struggling in his relationship with his wife and a young son. Um, and with his, I think, sort of his perspective on ministry. And I didn't know where to go. And I'm, oftentimes I'm not very bashful about just saying, you know, I, I really don't know what I'm doing here. But you know what? Jesus knows. And he knows where we need to go. And so I was thinking those thoughts and sort of silently saying, Lord, where? And the qu a question popped into my mind. And, and I love when that happens because I know it's not me. And I looked at him and I said, so what's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of your dad? And he looked at me for a split second and he put his head down on the table and sobbed. His whole body shook. And I just waited and after a while he looked up and wiped the tears I said, what was that about? He said, well, my dad was a, a conservative Mennonite preacher. And everybody loved him at church. But they had no clue how angry he was, how short-fused he was at home. He said, when I was probably, I think he said 11 or 12 years old, he said, I was playing there on the farm. And I, I ran around behind the barn where my dad was working and he said, as I went by, he reached out and grabbed me, picked up about an 18-inch long piece of conduit and started thrashing me and just beat on me. And after he was sort of done, he turned me loose and let me go. I said, I said, why? He said, I have absolutely no idea. I said, have, have you ever talked about that with your dad? He said, no, never have. But as we invited the Holy Spirit to come and sort of unwrap that for him, what he discovered was that probably in that moment, primarily, there may have been other events, but right there, that he pulled his heart away and became sort of an emotional orphan. He said, if that's who dad is, I do not need dad. And so now he's trying to figure out how to connect with his own six-year-old son and with a couple neighborhood kids. And he was trying to, also trying to understand how to have a consistent devotional time with God and how to feel close, how to feel loved by the father. But he felt like there were walls there. But You know, Jesus said he came to heal broken hearts and to break the chains. And as we prayed together, Jesus came and just sort of cleared that all out of the way as he chose to forgive his dad, to not hold it against his dad. These, this is uh, David and Rhoda Showalter. People ask where I come from, and I say, I'm house and lineage of David. <laughs> Wonderful, godly parents. Um, my mother passed away January 1 of 2011. My dad passed away five years ago at 96. I tell Bonnie, if I got my dad's strong genes, she's doomed. 
I was digging through some photos uh, and I came across this one. This is a, a picture of my dad sitting at his roll top desk in Eastern Kentucky, working on a sermon for Sunday. And if I snuck in close, I could get one like that. But I picture myself standing, I can almost feel it as I talk about it. I can almost feel myself standing in the doorway <clears throat> and looking into the study. And there were ways that I, I, I was so proud of my dad. I, I, just an amazing Bible scholar, Bible student, great preacher. But it felt like he was distant. And I knew that if I, if I wanted his time, who was I going to be competing with? With God. I'm going to be the loser there. No question. And it's not about my dad or about blaming him, but it's about what you and I do with the things that come that hurt or that wound us and the ways that the enemy comes then to bring lies. I told you that there's always a reason why you and I do the things we do. And we have a choice as to what we're going to do with those wounds. We can either allow them to affect every relationship that we get into for the rest of our lives. Or we can choose to bring them to Jesus. Um, there never ever was a question about whether my father loved me. I knew that, but I didn't always feel it. There were ways where he, from, from where he grew up where emotions weren't anything that you do. I mean, it was he, was, he was pretty much a stoic. Loved my mom dearly. And I would say gave us as kids a, a really a good model how to love a wife. I mean, I think I do a pretty decent job of loving Bonnie. Under the bed again tonight, Jay. <laughs> but there were ways that, that he was emotionally closed and didn't always know how to connect emotionally with, with the kids. Um, and if you and I didn't feel protected or comforted or safe with dad here, we may, we may spend a lifetime looking for a place of safety. And I believe that we're seeing what I call sometimes an epidemic of alienation from our father roots today. There are a lot of people who believe that the majority of who we become, our identity is formed in that father-child relationship. And, the, and I think the reality is true whether dad is present or whether he's absence, absent. Now that doesn't minimize uh, the role of mom. Who was it? Abe Lincoln or somebody like that who said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the nation. I suspect that most of us, in one way or another, know some kind of wound from way back from dad. may not be deep, but the things that you and I don't get figured out or get resolved, typically we take those along and they become a source of pain later on. And what you and I experience often as grown-ups, I believe, is wired, hardwired right into the things that happened in childhood. It may not always be about dad. It might be about an angry mom or a, a brother or an uncle or whoever. But if the pain and if those wounds were left uncomforted by dad here, Oftentimes, we really struggle to feel comforted in the presence of the good father. And we may spend a lifetime 
looking for that home, that emotional home, that place of safety. And I can tell you stories. Um, I don't know if I told you that I could, maybe, I, maybe in a conversation with one of you, but I could take you back to a spot on the gravel in eastern Kentucky where on a Sunday morning where I had words with my dad, hard words, and I was hurt pretty deeply. And I think for me, that was a time when I said, okay, at 14, 15 maybe, I think I, think I said, okay, count me out. And I struggled for a lot of years in my relationship with my dad. And I didn't realize how much I was looking for a dad to answer the burning question for me. And so I'm, I'm, I won't go into that, but there were a number of situations that I found myself in where looking back now, my vision looking back is pretty clear. I think I was just looking for a dad. And so you and I can come home to the Heavenly Father. But oftentimes what we do is whatever those relationship issues were with Dad, we just sort of transfer those here. And so I don't have time to do a survey with you, but I want you to just think about it. Think about your personal relationship with Jesus right now and ask yourself, what is that like? And, and, and are there any ways that it looks like my relationship with my dad? In my other life with my other wife, we did survey. We asked that question and handed out surveys in probably five or six churches. And it was amazing how much our devotional time parallels that relationship with dad. Unless we have intentionally gone to the cross and invited Jesus to change that view or that perspective of the Heavenly Father. We talked about how God created you and me for relationship with Himself, with other people, with ourselves. We talked about how we have an enemy who comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, how the relationships become the primary target of that and how we experience the distance from the Father, alienation here, and the ways that we don't like what we see when we look in. And out of that, you and I, I think, have a longing for, an ache for intimacy. And we have this built-in awareness designed from God that there's so much more that is possible with Him, with parents, with a spouse, with people around us, but we tend to struggle with the hypocrisy, the masks, the walls, the barriers which block us. Part of the unique design, I believe, that God wires into you and me as men is that longing to be one with the Father. Jesus talked about it all through, through uh, the Gospel of John, as John records it. I'm not quite sure how it relates to ladies. I think there's something similar, but not quite in the same way. Um, and I could give you lots and lots of examples of what that looks like when we, uh, when little guys just want to be with dad. And they'll do wild, crazy things sometimes just to be with dad or to be like dad. Another one of the, the, those foundational principles of God's design, which he built into human nature, I believe, um, as people who are created in his image, is the principle that whatever you and I hide from God, he'll let you and me keep it hidden. Let's go back, uh, for example, to the very beginning, to our first parents. They sinned 
And they ran and hid, right? Headed for the bushes. God comes just to hang out with them like he did. And he had a momentary lapse of his, what would it be, omniscience, his all-knowing. He didn't know where they were. And so he said, Adam, Eve, where are you guys? Is that the way you read it? No. If he knew, why didn't he just sneak up and say, boo, gotcha. What did God want? Why did he call? I'm sorry? Yes. Or sometimes we might use the word confess. He wanted them to just admit the reality of what they had done. It's no different with you and me today. When we run and hide or when we keep stuff hidden, God calls to you and me. He says, Don, Jay, Kevin, come. Bring that stuff. And why do we think that he doesn't already know all that? But for some reason, we keep it hidden. And so you and I, we have to make a choice to what? To walk in the light as he is in the light. And he gave us another image in Revelation 3, what was it? 3.10 of, of himself knocking at the door. And he said, if you do what? If you don't open this door, I am coming in. No. No, he said, it's up to you. If you open the door, I'll come in and hang out with you. Have a taste of the valley. <laughs> so it's our choice. If you ask me to do something that I'm really good at, count me in. Uh, I tend to avoid the things that I'm afraid I, I, I'll get shown up or whatever. You know, it's sort of like that when it comes to parenting or to fathering. And I might be slow in reaching out to my own son or daughter emotionally because no one ever did it for me. And I struggle to figure out who I am as a man or a woman. And there's only one person that can set you and me free from maybe generations of not knowing who we are as people, as, as men and women, from abandonment into being a daughter of the king, being a son, a beloved son. That's what Jesus came to do on the cross. And it's what he'll do for any man or woman that invites him into those places of wounding. Because we talked about this earlier, uh, he came to restore relationship. In John 14, he said, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. That's what I came for, to show you the Father and to remind you and me, maybe out of generations of abandonment, to letting you and me know that we're surrounded by his favor, that we're beloved sons, beloved daughters. Remember back in the Old Testament, men would every now and then refer to God as Father, but never as my father. Every now and then, maybe our father. Jesus comes along, and he not only talks about God as my father, but he uses that, that close, intimate, I think it's Aramaic maybe, Abba, which means what? Daddy, Papa. I don't know about you, Sometimes I get a little weary when I hear people saying, Abba, Abba. They're not Jewish and they're not Hebrew. <laughs> and it's foreign to them. I'd like to know what they grew up with, unless they were not close to dad when they were growing up and somehow they've connected. I guess I need to be okay with that, don't I? And so that's the, that's the intimacy that Jesus wants to show you and me. 
And it's that kind of closeness which is at the heart of everything that Jesus came to show us. Paul talks about a different analogy in the New Testament. And I'm excited. Neil and who are in the process here, yes, in the process of adopting. Paul talked about the adoption analogy. It's because we've been adopted into the Father's family that we can say, Daddy, Papa. I get really weary um, in a lot of what I see today in the media and wherever, where, where dads are portrayed as bumbling idiots, buffoons, irrelevant. They don't matter. And I could tell you stories and it's almost time to close. Um, but if a man is taught that the father is not important when he's growing up, then he's going to act the same way with his own kids when he becomes a father himself. And he won't know how important he is to his children, especially, I believe, to his sons, because way down deep inside, there's a wounded little boy that says, it's just better not to go there, better not to to know, not safe or not to. And so to know how important a dad is to his sons, to his own sons, daughters, I believe that he needs to go back and remember and confess and if need be, forgive how important his own father was to him. I've talked to men sometimes that have buried the pain so deep they hardly know it's there. And when a man has been wounded that way. He doesn't need to be told that his father's love is, or encouragement is really not important, that it's worthless. He needs to know that there is a good father, that the father God of all men and women, he calls you and me now to himself as beloved sons and beloved daughters. Think about it. The good father knew that his son in the flesh needed to know what he thought about him, right? And so he said it, I think, three times audibly. This is my son. This is the son that I am delighted in. In my paraphrase, I am so proud of him. I encourage dads to use that line if you're okay with it. Use it with your sons, with your daughters. They need to hear that kind of affirmation from us. But the enemy wants to rob them. And so I think sometimes for us as men, it's not about becoming a father, but it may be about that sort of elementary and critical step to manhood of becoming a son and understanding that piece. I don't know about you, I don't know how many of you, if your journey was a little bit like mine and you found yourself becoming a spiritual orphan in ways, being cut off from dad as a young, uh, as a child, a small girl or boy. So my freedom, I mean my passion rather, is to help men and women who have been wounded by Father, but who are honest enough to reject, re, reject the world's quick fix of denying it all, dare to consider Dad's humanity, his limitation, and begin to understand that neither Dad nor any other man on the planet can fill that deep, deep longing, that Father longing that the good Father put there. Who wants to grow up without forfeiting father love. Who's ready to realistically, hear me carefully, realistically thank Jesus for whatever level of love and, and emotional connection your dad was able to give. He did the best that he knew how to do. Thank God for that. And stop demanding Something that he doesn't know how to give or that he's unable to give. And then to surrender those wounds to Father God who defines and who shapes all of us as men and women. So when does healing begin? 
begins when you and I, like I walked you through last evening, <clears throat> when we choose to forgive. <coughs> it's not about warm, fuzzy feelings, but it's about, in a sense, the cold, hard decision to legally cancel the debt. No more debt. And to take personal responsibility now for where we're at in this journey. <laughs> I heard one speaker say one time, the truck that ran you over ain't coming back to fix you. <laughs> and people can control our lives from the grave if we allow them to because of pain or the ways that they wounded us. And if we choose to stop blaming. Then the best part of this is that you and I, when our hearts are free, we can come to the good Father. And we can see the sparkle in His eyes and the smile bust out on His face when He sees us coming. Just because He likes us. <laughs> Because he loves us. Just because he wants to hang out with you and me as sons and daughters. Paul in Philippians 3.10, he said what? He said, I just want to know him. I just want to know him. And that's my prayer for each of us. I'm going to close. It's time. And invite the worship team to come. I think they have another song for us. Last evening I led you through a prayer of choosing to forgive. And it's so critical that you and I are willing to just go to the cross with whoever it is, dad or someone else. Jesus, thank you so much for this delightful church family here at Allensville Mennonite. Thank you for warm hearts of hospitality and the ways that they've received Bonnie and me. Jesus, will you make Allensville Mennonite a lighthouse and a place of safety in this community by your spirit? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Um, this last song is um, The Blessing. We sang it a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's just uh, kind of a benediction song as we wrap up our meetings and, um, and take home with us um, what Don has shared, what God has laid on his heart. So um, if you're able, stand with us and, and receive, receive this blessing for from from God
He is for you. He is for you. Do you believe that? From the bottom of your toes to the top of your head, I hope you surely do, because he is for you, and he is with you. And what a wonderful song and a wonderful scripture to uh, sing, to celebrate the, uh, these times with Don and Bonnie. And uh, we praise God and thank you, too, for Don and Bonnie for coming and sharing with us. We know God has a healing heart, and he passes that on to his servants, and he's given that uh, to Don. And so we thank you for your healing heart that you have, that you can come and minister among us and share with us during, during this time and these last days. And So we've sung a blessing, and I'd like to read to a blessing uh, from Scripture that reflects the love of the Father for people. And this is uh, from Ephesians chapter 3 again, and it communicates the love that God... The Father has shown to us um, through the Son, and then we'll pray a blessing as well. 
And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Thank you, God, again for the depth of your love for people. Thank you that you are with us in every season of life. Uh, whether we feel your love or not, we do know that you do indeed love us uh, in every season of life, and you've communicated that love to us through your son and his sacrifice, and you continue to communicate that love to us through speaking to our hearts from your heart and from your word and from your people. And we thank you for the messages we've heard, uh, again, where we've been reinforced about the truth of the reality of Satan's attack to uh, break our relationship with you, to hinder our relationship with you, but ultimately it is by coming, by confessing, by being united, restored, and by maintaining relationship with you that we can maintain joy and love and fullness in life. And so we thank you that you're a healing God uh, and that you desire to heal your people and that you uh, are with us again every minute of every day, and we thank you for that. May you continue to be glorified and honored through Don and Bonnie and through each one in this congregation. And uh, thank you that you're a great God and that we can praise you. May we bring you honor and may we please you by how we live our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.